Do you remember when you were little, the feeling that you'd get when you discovered something for the first time? When you figured out how to do something? Like when you figured out how to build a stink bomb? <laughs> that feeling, that feeling, I don't know how to use an iPad. Um, do I just advance this? Okay. So that feeling, as um, inventors are addicted to that feeling. We're like those little kids who never grew up because we get our highs off of those feelings. So little kids have those discovery moments all the time. Everything is new, right? So you always have those aha moments. Those aha moments are the most special feelings in the world. Those are the feelings that make me feel most powerful, most beautiful, and smartest. And those are the feelings that you really just want to keep having over and over again. But they're elusive when you get to be an adult. It's really hard to have those aha moments. And those aha moments are really what drive me, and most inventors, I think. So how, what is the next big crazy idea that's going to impact the world. So every time an inventor comes up with an idea, they try to come up with something even bigger and bolder and uh, more impactful than the previous. So I thought, well, the ultimate invention, being a sci-fi geek, is uh, like the gray goo, like these, these uh, nanorobots that would self-replicate, is to make more of us, right? If we can invent more of us, oops, we could do so much. So I've been t thinking about this idea. If inventors would try to make more inventors, and if we, were, if we were effective at doing this, we could really harness this power to change the world for the good. So I started a new program, a new graduate program at UC Irvine, to do exactly this, to take students who are interested in being entrepreneurial in a medical device space and to help them become entrepreneurs and to help them to think creatively and outside the box. And, um, you know, so in, in researching how to unleash that creativity and to get people to think outside the box, I remembered back to one of my favorite Einstein quotes. Right. To stimulate creativity, one must develop a childlike inclination for play. And I love that quote. Right? And so I'm trying to figure out, well, how do you un tap back into that childhood creativity of play in adults? And then I thought, well, what's the easier thing to do? The easier thing to do is to just work with kids, right? Because kids have that natural creativity. Instead of having to, to undo you know, a lifetime of being told how to think, these kids actually see things differently than the way we were taught to see things. So these kids are very good, naturally, at play. And play is such an important pastime. How many, how many adults remember playing as a child? Maybe your favorite childhood memories? How many of you remember to play today? <laughs> a couple, not too many. And why is that, right? To be a professional athlete, you have to play. You play baseball. I play tennis. I don't get better at playing tennis by watching YouTube videos of people playing tennis. I have to be playing tennis. And, you know, we play music. Why don't we play science? Why does science always have to be relegated to be this boring thing that is not actually really science. Science is all about play because science is about trying things and failing and realizing your hypothesis was wrong and that'll get you closer to the right hypothesis. That's what science was built on. But we forget that when we try to teach our children how to do science. So baseball is a perfect example, right? I mean, to get to a 300 batting average, right? That, I mean, that's, that's really good. It's hard to do that naturally, right? Um, and if you think about those statistics, that's what, a three out of 10 hits. If that was a kid taking a test, a science test, that would be a 30%, that would be failing, right? Why can't we just let our kids discover things and try things out and see what works and what doesn't work? So creativity is in short supply in this country, right? We all notice um, people talk about a creativity crisis. Our educational system is not doing well. And the reason for that, it makes perfect sense. 
Our public school system was set up for the age of industrialism. It was set up to create good factory workers, to create people who can take orders and work in a factory line. Right? You don't want people thinking outside the box if they're working in a factory line. Right? But we don't need those types of people right now. Now we need people who think, who think outside the box. If you teach children how to think linearly, like an assembly line, right, then you can't expect them to think outside the box when they grow up. If you have this cookie cutter approach to teaching science, that's exactly how they are going to, everybody is going to be, th be thinking about science in the same way when they grow up. Right. So we need to flip this on its head. We need to, um, and other countries are recognizing this. They see this need to move to, uh, to really embrace creativity. And we need to figure out, as a nation, we need to figure out how to reignite our imaginations. Now, I hated school. I was terrible at school. I was told that I was slow and I was bad at math and science. I got terrible grades. And they thought that, um, you know, I just didn't have the aptitude when, in fact, I just didn't think the way that science was taught. And eventually I figured out how to, you know, play to their tests and to answer the tests, but it didn't mean I learned more science in school. And it wasn't until I got to college that I realized that I really did love science. Because I was fortunate enough to start research in a lab when I was at Berkeley, I was in mechanical engineering, and I started research oops, in a lab, and I was asked to investigate the impact response of the human torso to taekwondo kicks. Right. Sounds like a pretty cool project, right? <laughs> so how do you do this? So we made a simulated foot that we shot in a cannon, in a pneumatic cannon, at a simulated person, I named him Fred, Oops. And we looked at the impact response of this poor simulated Fred. And uh, that picture is really old. That was taken when I was 18 or 19 years old. But how, what kid would not love that, right? It was fun and it was creative and it, the questions were open-ended and I got to tinker and I got to play. And I love that and it was addictive. And I found more avenues for, for this when I was in college. We built a human-powered vehicle. It was a crazy-looking bike. It was a tandem bike, so it's fully feared with two person riding in that thing. It was made of uh, carbon fiber. We won several world speed records off of it. I think mine's is still standing. And it was fun, you know? We crashed it all the time, but that was okay, right? Because it really made me the engineer that I became because I built an intuition for how to do things and how to build things by playing. When the consequences didn't matter that much, right? It doesn't matter if you fail. To tell you about the next part of my life, I really have to tell you a little bit more about my childhood. So as I mentioned, I was not a good student. I hated school, but I loved to play. Right. So, oops. So I was very much like Calvin and Calvin and Hobbes where I had a very good imagination and um, I had lots of pretend friends, not many real friends. Um, but I had a mom who loved to play with me all the time. She was a stay-at-home mom, but she was a chemist um, she, who decided to quit her job to raise me. And she was always encouraging me to play. And we built all sorts of things. And the kitchen was my lab. And you know the neighborhood was my field study. And it really empowered me because not only did she give me shrinky dinks, <laughs> but she also instilled in me this belief that I could be anything I wanted to be. And at the time, when I was little, I looked up to my mom. I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. I didn't even know what professors did. But I felt like Wonder Woman when I was playing and I was with my mom. And that's the most amazing feeling in the world, right? To feel like a superhero when you're a kid. And that feeling that you can really get through anything and that you could really be that powerful really came in handy about a quarter of a century later. 
because uh, my first faculty position before I came to UC Irvine was at the brand new University of California campus, Merced, which is out by Yosemite. And people told me this was a wonderful opportunity because they knew I was entrepreneur, I had done startups. They said this is like, um, you know, this is a startup university. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And it really is because you'd never want to do it twice. <laughs> so, <laughs> My research is based on doing, uh, making micro and nanotechnology. So how you usually do this is in a clean room, much like the Intel inside commercials, and you want to pattern things at very, very high resolution, right? To be able to get down to those small scales, you need to focus the light beam to smaller and smaller scales. And so this is usually done with very high-end equipment to make these tiny chips for diagnostics. Well, when I got to UC Merced, and so in academia, it's really a matter of publish or perish. And so I started getting a little worried. Um, and then I had to figure out, uh, are you guys advancing my slides for me? Can you go to the next one? Um, the, the iPad says it's timed out. So I really had to figure out what to do. And being a tinkerer, by nature, this is what I would always do as a child. I was playing around in my kitchen one night, and I realized to get those really high resolution structures that I wanted for my microchips to be able to do micro and nanotechnology, everybody else was trying to pattern light, to focus light to a very, very small scale. And I said, well, what if we flip this problem on its head? What if we patterned everything at the large scale and then shrunk everything down? And what platform would allow me to do that? My favorite children's toy, Shrinky Dinks. And so I published on this against uh, advisement from a lot of my colleagues. They said it might be career suicide to publish a paper um, called Shrinky Dink Microfluidics. And <laughs> the paper went viral within a couple of months and the editor of the journal called me up and he said he's never seen anything like this. Our paper had received more downloads than all the Royal Society of Chemistry journals. They own about 10 journals by about 10,000. So then we were, we thought we might be on to something and we started pushing the technology a little bit more. Can you keep advancing? Thanks. And then over the years, um, you know, it, they said, uh, we've gotten quite a bit of recognition. We've developed many technologies off of this platform. We still use this platform in my lab. And we've done some really, really cool things with it, I think. We make um, flexible electronics, wearable electronics. We make these interesting surfaces for sensing, um, for, uh, a variety of different applications. But I want to do something even more impactful. Next slide, please. I want to pay this forward, right? My nephew, that's my nephew there, he also thinks he's a superhero. He thinks he's Batman. He's going to turn three in a couple of weeks. And I want him to live in a world where he's never told that he's dumb or that he can't do something because he thinks differently than other people. And I don't want any child to ever feel like that. And so how to do this? Next slide, please. So in 1959, Richard Feynman, who's arguably one of the most famous physicists ever, um, basically heralded the coming of nanotechnology in a famous talk called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom at Caltech. And he said, he said, well, what if you can, can imagine taking something that can make something smaller, that can make something smaller, that can make something smaller. Imagine the power of a hundred tiny hands. And so we want to actually do that. We want to imagine, create the power of a hundred tiny hands. So as a professor, I just have to come up with the crazy ideas. My students have to figure out how to make that work. So <laughs> I threw this out to my students at the beginning of the summer. And I said, well, if I technically invented you guys, we need to have you guys come up with stuff that can invent our next batch of inventors at a younger age. How do we do that? And so we came up with a bunch of different inventors kits, these modules to teach open-ended um, creativity, uh, you know, things that we can do, but to teach actual science. So we have our supervision kits where the kids would make their own lenses that snaps onto their iPhone or iPad and take pictures at very, very high resolution. And so you can see my student Jolie there is working with a high school student. Next, please. And they're taking pictures at very high magnification. Um, and Protective, it, it's inspired. 
Oops. And they can take videos at very high resolution as well. Are you telling me work for this project? You know. Next slide, please. And we can also make surfaces that repel water. So we can create different types of structures so that they can build things that don't wet. These are little like tiles that they can build together and build interesting um, patterns and games with. And so the idea behind this was that we wanted to create uh, an environment, a community that would embrace people of all ages and enable them to be inventors and innovators without having to be in a university setting. So we want to have these kits accessible, but also the ingredients to make your own kits. And if a 10-year-old, you know, in, in Boston decides that she wants to put together a kit and comes up with a good idea, we'll help her develop the educational content around it and we'll package it and she will be the inventor on that kit. So we want to enable children to not have to wait until they're adults to be able to become inventors uh, and engineers, but they can do it at any age. Next slide, please. So the idea behind us is really, if you guys watch Monsters, Inc., right, the monsters would collect the screams from little kids to power their cities, right? That was the energy. Instead of screams, we want to use those aha moments. If we can collect Right? The collective power of all those aha moments. There are about 2 billion children on Earth. If we can reach those kids that can't have access to school, if we can get to all those kids and give them aha moments and then leverage that aha moment so that they're working on developing technology to make the world a better place. Next slide, please. So we did, a, we did some focus groups and you know the kids really love, you can see their faces really light up. They're excited when they build stuff. And next slide, please. One of the interesting things about all of this is this is my team um, that put together the educational kits, which is a subset of my lab. And if you look at this, right, like it didn't even, we forget when we look at, when I look at my lab, right, they're engineers, they're very, very good engineers. But a mom pointed out that they love the fact that there were so many cool girls in my group. And if you think about it, 89% of engineers are men right now. Next slide, please. So, we want to uh, change the face of inventors. We don't want them to have to be an adult of a certain uh, you know, gender or demographic. We want everyone to have access to becoming inventors. And so if you think about the attributes that you need to become, to be an inventor, right? People typically say you need to be creative and motivated by challenges, not afraid of failure, resistant and idealistic. Those are really the qualities that every kid has. Right. And on top of that, I would add that what is true of kids that isn't necessarily true of inventors is that kids genuinely want to make the world a better place. They want to be good. They want to do good, right? So if you think about it, kids are really superheroes. So as adults, I'm asking you guys to help empower your little superheroes and play with them and let them really show us the power that, that they have. Thank you.